There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Well, welcome to another Word in Your Attic. Now, about 15 years ago, I was invited to a, to a party uh, on a boat moored by the Houses of Parliament uh, by the guitarist of the band who, who were playing uh, at the time, consisting of four MPs, called naturally MP4. And I think they played Beatles songs and Wilson Pickett and uh, Steve Earle stuff. And if that isn't sufficiently extraordinary, their guitarist has now made a solo album, which I'm saying is a key event in our rich political history. <laughs> so welcome aboard, Kevin Brennan, the MP for Cardiff West. Kevin, is that a first, I think that's the first time a, a, an MP has ever released an album. I mean, I know Pete Wishart, who was in M MP4, who was in Run Rig and, uh, and uh, uh, Big Country, I think he made a record, but only after, only before he was an MP. So is this the first time an MP has ever made a record? Um, well, not made a record, but probably a solo album, I think. Yeah. He is, yeah. And uh, Pete was in Renrig, Renrig for 18 years, as you say, as a keyboard player and was on top of the pops and played in. Before being an MP, though, I think. Was yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. So he was a full time professional musician. But the other, the other members of the band all sort of had musical experience at various different levels. I was a bit more of a folky than the others, although I played in rock bands as well. And we had a guy called Ian Causey who's lost his seat now, but we, he still plays in the band. We still play. Um, we, we you were a we, cross-party alliance, weren't you? Exactly, was, yeah. I mean, it was you was, and another Labour MP, and then there was yeah. SNP. And yeah, Ian, was, Ian was a Labour MP. Um, we didn't kick him out of the band because... Uh, well, you know, the police, none of them were police, we thought, so it didn't matter if he wasn't an MP anymore, he could still be an MP4. And uh, then there was a, we had a Tory drummer, we still got him, uh, Sir Greg Knight is our drummer. <laughs> Very uh, good, and, <laughs> Sir Greg Knight, <laughs> Tory a, drummer, that's brilliant. Sounds a contradiction in terms, but actually he used to play in quite a few soul bands in the 70s and stuff, and he was... He's a good drummer. So um, so we, we had the skills for the first time in the 700 years of Parliament to form a rock band. We're pretty confident of that. Was the so, first so, every, so when there's a new intake of MPs, do you place a, a no, notice on the notice board saying, looking for a keyboard player or <laughs> anybody play the harmonica or whatever? I mean, how do you find out whether people have got those yeah, kind of skills? Sabs, quo, heap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny you should say that because we did exactly that after 2010 thinking oh we we you know our fan base will kind of disappear if we don't recruit some of the new intake and so we did we have tried once or twice and and taken people into the setup but it disrupts the balance of the band man do you know what i mean oh, right. <laughs> and uh, so we did get one guy in uh, called david morris who was a very good guitarist in theory, uh, you know, but it never seemed to work live. Let's put it that way. So that didn't last very long. And and we've had another guy who stepped in for us called David Dukit, who's a Scottish MP, who's, a, again, a very good guitar player. And he's stepped in once or twice. We did a TV show with Matt Ford, the comedian, for a few series. And if Pete couldn't make it, we, we, we'd sort of uh, substitute a guitar player for the keyboard player a few times. But the original band still there all these years later. So are, are, are there kind of rehearsal facilities anywhere in the P Palace of Westminster? Do you do you go off to a committee room somewhere with a few acoustic guitars? With, with, with metal mattresses on the wall. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> actually, the, the fortunate thing is Greg's office, which is in the main Palace of Westminster, it, it's got those sort of six foot thick walls from, you know, the, 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 the 16th century or something. So they're, so it, we can actually get away with rehearsing in there if we don't, you know, turn it up full blast. And he's got some electronic drums, which you can control the volume on. So it is possible to for us to rehearse. And these days, because we've been doing it for so long, it's just tightening up things usually rather than rehearsing too much new material. So it's, I just love the idea that, you know, that the other side of the wall is a load of people talking about, you know, the fuel crisis or whatever. And then you're in there <laughs> bashing that, away, you know. That is literally true because his office is kind of underneath the 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 the, the chamber so, so just above us they're all talking about the latest uh, issues and and where <laughs> distant practices and the running, bass you know. guitar coming yeah yeah rumbling up brilliant yeah, very good exactly 
Well, look, we traditionally start these these things by by talking about the record playing equipment uh, that was in your home at the time. And where did you grow up? It was in in in, in Cumbran, though. Is that right? That is correct. Cumbran, New Town in yeah. South Wales is where I grew up. I, I, Irish father and a Welsh mother, so uh, you know, kind of a, quite a musical household in many ways. Um, although they didn't play, you know, anything formally, they're very keen on music. Both my parents. And we always did have a record player of some sort. I think the the earliest ones we had was one of those very basic little one unit record players. But yeah, after yeah. a while, with I have two older sisters who are very keen on music, and they acquired one of those music centres, you know, with the radio in it. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. and the and the turntable on it. So that was the main um, way of playing records. You know, when I got a little bit older, into my so, you know, 11, 12. And what 15. was that? What sort of things did your parents have? Do you remember? Well, I, actually, I can show you. Yeah, and, and this, oh, this, wow. this is where it all starts because it was nearly all Irish records when uh, when I was growing oh, up. Right. So there's yeah, uh, the Clancy oh, yeah. Brothers. Yeah. Brothers with yeah, Tommy yeah. Macon and their with family. So and their families. So it, it kind of started for me a lot with with Irish music because my my father, you know, loved music and loved Irish music. So it was the Clancy Brothers. It was the Dubliners. That sort of thing before we started playing records ourselves. And you know, the Beatles came along and. Uh, and, and so that that was that was where it all started for me with Irish folk music in in the house. The first sort of records I ever heard were those. What was the first record you bought? Can you remember actually going? I can actually, yeah. It, and where did you buy it? In fact, somewhere? well, the first album I bought, I bought secondhand from my mate Kevin Griffin, and it was Zeppelin One, the first Zeppelin album. Oh, but sadly, wow. I no longer have. I I was going to cheat and borrow my mate's copy. I know he's got a sort of pristine, <laughs> newly pressed vinyl copy, but uh, in the end, I thought I was cheating. But um, you know, I loved that record, and I played it to, to absolute death. I bought it for a pound secondhand off uh, Kevin Griffin. The first single I ever bought, and I'm going to defend this to the hilt, right, <laughs> against any criticism, was Nothing Rhymed by Gilbert O'Sullivan. Nothing uh, wrong with that. No shame. Which There's no a, shame in any of it. <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is a great song. And I, I you know, I, I still say that is a great song. I know that perhaps it got a little bit cheesy sometimes a bit later on some of um, Gilbert O'Sullivan's output, but that is a fabulous Fabulous um, song. I think it still stands up if you play it today. I haven't got the so, anymore, did you did you did you see him on top of the pops and so forth? And those are the days when he wore his kind of uh, his cap and his uh, shorts and so forth. Do you see all that stuff? Do you remember? Yeah, that? I remember seeing him on top of the pops in that um, strange outfit, which I think <laughs> probably didn't Do you, help you him. wonder if he doesn't regret that because there has been a sort of movement <laughs> towards reassessing. <laughs> Yeah. His records, people like Pete Perfides in his wonderful book, you know, talked about how much he loved him as a kid. And um, and they are really good records. But our mental image of, of Gilbert O'Sullivan yeah. is that guy in that yeah. hat. And, and that just, well, the kind of comedy, sort of like a sort of Norman Wisdom character. And it just, it was, just defeats the whole thing. There was a tendency for that to happen. And I, I, I presume that the people like him were persuaded to call themselves Gilbert O'Sullivan rather than Ray O'Sullivan, the serious you know, Anglo-Irish singer, songwriter, and he became yeah. Gilbert O'Sullivan, this kind of, you know, and you had to have that music hall outfit of the urchin from Edwardian times, which he yeah, adopted. To get, to get notice, I suppose it's very interesting, because if you look back at the times, there were two guys, singer-songwriters, who played the piano, both played the piano, both yeah. emerged around about the same time. Both came through small record companies, both changed their names. One was Gilbert O'Sullivan, the other was Elton John. Yeah, no. <laughs> and, and, you know, and one ascends to myth and, and ri riches beyond the dreams of avarice. And the, and the other one's Gilbert O'Sullivan. Derision. You know? I know, yeah. and uh, in in a way, Gilbert O'Sullivan was the more serious artist in some ways. If you you know, songs like "Alone Again," "Naturally," or yeah, you know, they're pretty deep, you know, powerful, meaningful, psychological kind of songs. Uh, and and Elton John's never written a lyric in his life. Oh um, well, no, yeah, absolutely. But um, yeah, he wrote and, him himself, Gilbert, <laughs> and he wasn't averse to dressing up in a in a in a weird costume either. But uh, he took the obviously took the correct turn. Into another one who falls into the category around the same era, and again, I'll I'll defend his early work against any derision. And I've got an album here of his actually, which I still think is a great album. Is Leo Sayer, and uh, all right, okay, the, the no, first no. Leo Sayer album, Silverbird. Silverbird. This album, 
that's Leo Tay, what he looked like. Of course, what he looked like on top of the pops was like that, because he, yeah. like he wore the clown makeup and all that. But Silverbird is actually a really great album and deserves going back to and listening to it. It was the first album he made. And he co-wrote all the songs with a guy called David Courtney. They also wrote David all the songs Courtney, on David Courtney, of course. They also wrote all the songs on Roger Daltrey's first um, solo yes. album. Uh, you know, and which and, was a big hit. Which big was a big hit. hit. Uh, Just a boy giving it all away. That's that single. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. amazing. But, Leo Sayers has genuinely got forgotten, hasn't he? Yeah, it's quite he interesting. Went, he went down another route as well, didn't he? He made about two records where I think he was trying to be a serious singer songwriter but also again frozen in time by that probably ill-advised kind of image thing early on you know which yeah, is so much pressure on everyone to do gilbert but, O'Sullivan and leo say are both both sort of got pushed down that route. they did no, they did uh, that led do you remember away. who you, do you remember you used to manage leo say yes and it was adam faith wasn't it? adam faith um, managed him and and do you remember where Adam Faith's office was? No, I don't. <laughs> My favourite bit of pop trivia. <laughs> I love that. As if, as if we should all know, Dave. That's a really <laughs> everyone knows. When, this. I thought I was doing when quite I, well. Remember when I remind you, <laughs> yeah, go on. When I remind you, you will remember. Adam Faith did not have an office. Uh -huh. He used to take all his meetings in Fortnum and Masons on Piccadilly. <laughs> oh, really? He used to have a corner table. In the restaurant in Fulham Masons, and if you wanted to meet with Adam Faith when he was manager of Leo Sayer, was a, was a really big deal. You had to go to Fulham Masons. Well, that's, that's a brilliant it. ruse because that would have been cheaper per annum than renting an <laughs> office in the rent. West End. <laughs> Absolutely. Once a week, you just have a table, but they, the, the other people are probably paying for it anyway. So great. <laughs> it was quite a well, renaissance. Anyway, sorry, sorry about you. Adam Faith. Yeah. He also, do you remember that TV show Budgie? He yes, I certainly do. So he's yeah, actor, he did manager, it. pop star. He was a. He did he, everything. He did yeah. everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, how do we get onto that? Yeah, yeah, that's a di digression upon digression. Leo Sayer, Vargil O'Sullivan. This is superb stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else have you got? Can you remember? And, and what was the record shop? The, 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 what was? Do you remember the local record shop? What it was like? Yeah, in Cumbrian Town Centre, there was a a, um, a a record shop. And it was quite a large one because it also sold musical instruments as well. Um, right. <clears throat> I think the first record I bought was probably from the department store in Cumbramcha. was David Evans's or something like that. But they had, David a, little Evans. They had a little record department as well. But then there was a, a music... Can you remember the person in charge of it? David, I was talking about that. It was, it was always sort of kind of either the kind of token hip person or yeah. a really frumpy woman who'd much rather be working in uh, domestic appliances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were the, the the hip guys were in the uh, in the, the the music shop in Cumbran Town Centre, and you know I used to gaze in the window at the Fender Stratocaster. Oh right, yeah, so yeah, three hundred yeah. pounds and beyond, you know, any sort of possibility of purchasing, and uh, and then you know go in and f flip through the albums and and buy records. Tell me this, you guys will both know this, being, being both um, semi-pro musicians. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, that's that's the still going, by the way. What happened to that? <laughs> no, no threat of a, of, of a reunion, let me tell you. <laughs> Has the pro... You, you, were, you were talking about how expensive instruments were when you, when you looked as a teenager in the window. Have musical instruments come down in price relatively? Yes. Without, without... They have, haven't they? So this is, by the way, this here is the first guitar I ever bought with my own money. And it's a sort of acoustic, it's a, Gib, it's a Japanese knockoff of a Gibson Black Dove acoustic guitar. And it cost me in 1976, it cost me £55 in 1976, right. um, which was a lot of money if you were working. I did, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Huge amount of money. I was as a Saturday boy, you know, in the supermarket and earning yeah, that's an my, hour. I think my wages there were around £10 a week. Yeah, it was, I think I got fifty pound, mean? fifty pence an hour in seventy six. Yeah, yeah. That actually, to be yeah. accurate, I think it was, no, it was more than and a half p yeah. <laughs> an hour from Fine Fair um, in Cumbrian before I I, I upgraded <laughs> to Marks and Spencer, much to my mother's delight, and got a job in the New <laughs> <market>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, you know, uh, but fifty five quid. When you think about that now, you know that is really several several hundred pounds, and you can buy a really good quality acoustic guitar these days you know a good yamaha or something like that for for you know a couple of hundred quid really and well and electric guitars were and... cripplingly expensive weren't they yeah, yeah they used to be ridiculous it was h but you had to put money away my, yeah. my sister, absolutely 
my did sister... you even do that in the 70s were you oh, even yeah. paying on hp in the 70s oh yeah and my sister knew her so so they, they, uh, the paper the local paper he had recently did a little article about the album and that, that's a picture of me and my sister, uh, Nula, when we were oh, right, okay. and sort of playing together. Nula was wow. the one who first got the uh, guitar and she got a 12 string and her birthday was on Christmas Day. So she always got a, a bigger birthday present because it was double birthday and Christmas. And I remember my dad, who didn't like credit at all or HP or anything of that kind, said, you know, you can... You can, you can have the uh, 12 string guitar, but you'll have to wait till April <laughs> before it arrives because we're going to have to pay, up, pay it off in installments before you can, uh, can get the guitar. So, yeah, you, did, you literally uh, you know, had to sort of pay installments and then pick it up later. Can you remember the and first of all? Go, oh, go on, Dave. Go on. No, carry on. Go on. I was going to say, can you remember the first, the first uh, group you ever saw? Yeah, it would have been, well... There was, a, there was a dance every Friday night in Crossy Kiliog School, actually, where they had live bands, which was great. And there were some really good bands that that um, rocked up there that later became much bigger. So Slade, for example. Oh, fantastic. What, so what year would this have been? This would be about whew, before they had a, a, a big hit. So probably about 1970, something like that, 71. We were about 11, 12 years of age. We used to go along to it and had Noddy and, got the hat with the mirrors on it by then and no, got the really. cape. No, they were much no, more that, that happened about seventy two, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. They were much more sort of skinhead style, you know, kind of uh, right, and, right. Yeah. and um Dave Edmonds played there as well. I think the uh, first proper gig I went to, which was in a what you might call a proper venue, was at the Cardiff Students Union, was the Kiki D band in the early seventies. Um, and it took something to be a female front to a rock band yeah. in those days because, it, you know, there, there was a pretty misogynistic crowd, as I recall. But I, I went with my sister's boyfriend who was in university and we, we stood at the back and, and saw the Kiki's E band in, in Cardiff Students' Union. And she was, was that like, when she was signed to Rocket Records, wasn't she? Well, she had a hit. She had, I well, got she, the music in me. She did. Right? She's a great record, actually. And... Um, she also had a hit with a song called Amoureuse. Do you remember that? It was a, oh, it was a of course. Ballad. Mm. I feel yeah, rainfall Veronique of another Sanson. planet was the lyric. I think it was a French translation. Or, or, yes, or, it was Veronique Sanson, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. The hit in America. Anyway, go on, carry yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so she was great. And then, I mean, later on, obviously, uh, you know, graduated. The, the big gigs I saw in the 70s, the ones I really remember, my, I went with my two sisters to, to Wembley Stadium in September 1974, to see uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, uh, oh, wow. Joni Mitchell, the band. Yeah. All these are all on the same. Got on the same bill. Jesse Colin Young, yeah. Oh all, my all lord! On, all on the same. I think they were all David Geffen stable, probably or something. Yeah, they were all on the same bill. The ticket cost three pounds fifty for the day. It's quite and, expensive. Uh, oh. uh, it was quite expensive, really. But I mean, you know. That they were on tour for the money by then, rather than the music. I think, but it was. So, it was no, how old were you then? I was fourteen. Fourteen Wembley we Stadium. Yeah, a the Wembley. band. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Incredible. I was fourteen. I had my two older sisters, Nula, who was sixteen, and Colleen, who was eighteen. I went right. And right. God, so that's really impressive. So when you saw Slade, you could only have been about what twelve or something. Yeah. Or? Yeah. Well, we all used to go over to this little dance at the school and they always had live bands and you know dave edmonds played there once ducks deluxe do you remember them yeah we oh do, yeah. yeah certainly do yeah. uh they, they, you know they had uh, other bands that were never heard of ever again obviously but um they, they had some great live bands there i don't know who was responsible for promoting it but did uh, you feel a fondness for uh and a sort of national support for welsh acts yeah. i mean i don't know if you did you feel you ought to go and listen to um uh, you know, man and people man. like that. I don't know. I saw, I saw the man Deke band. Deke Leonard. Oh, oh right. Saw, yeah. Deke Leonard, who's one of the funniest men alive. And I saw saw uh, saw them at Cardiff Castle. There were a series of gigs in the 70s at Cardiff Castle. Also, Budgie. Do you remember Budgie? Budgie, oh, yeah. yeah. Budgie, we Shelley. certainly do. Yeah. Another, another Welsh band at the time. So, yeah, there was definitely a lot of, uh, you know, patriotic support for the Welsh acts. Never quite, <laughs> never quite made the big time, apart from maybe uh, Andy Fairweather Low and Amen Corner. I so think. there's an interesting point. Who is the biggest Welsh band? Pro, pro, of Manic all Street time. Preachers? Um, of could, all time. It could be the Manic Street Preachers. Manic? Yeah. Of course it is. Of course it is. Of course it is. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. It was that but moment I... in the 90s when there was this kind of cool 
Cymru thing going on at the time when devolution was Oh, going. God, there was. All super furry the, animals? You're talking yeah, about? At the same time, you had the super furries, yeah. the organics, the phonics, and catatonia. Yes. Were sort of, you know, um, in the charts at the same time. I think that was the peak Welsh moment in, in, in pop history, probably. <laughs> The and, peak and Welsh was, moment, it's great. <laughs> and loads, of solo, loads of solo singers who still keep, I mean, Tom Jones, obviously. And, you know, well, you know and, and obviously with Shirley Bond, Bassey or whatever. <laughs> Bond in the news, you can't forget, you know, Shirley and Tom who were... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Bonnie Tyler? My no. Bonnie Tyler, exactly. I think yes. so. We were, we were talking about Bonnie Tyler only the other day, and uh, I was doing some research into the, into the career of Bonnie Tyler. My God, she sold a lot of records over a long period of time. Well, she did. I think was Lost in France her first hit. The first one, and then It's a Heartache, and then all that Jim Steinman stuff, and, you know, what, just over in, a really We discovered she owns stuff. colossal amounts of real estate, doesn't she, Dave? Just she owns half of New Zealand. Half of <laughs> New Zealand, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's really good. It's funny how you, in your mind, you just kind of think of the odd hit, and therefore you kind of, on the basis of that, you calibrate somebody's success. But no, no, she's been absolutely but not. She's a lot of money. She's invested yeah. it very wisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not which bad. Is not always been the case. Not bad people. for a girl called Gainer from Skewin near Swansea. Absolutely, <laughs> Gainer. Her real name. She, she, of course, uh, I think her, her big moment, though, wasn't it? Was she accidentally, um, her voice changed after she had a, a voice operation, one of those nodule operations. And she was told, oh, really? that was after Lost in France. And she was told she wasn't to talk for six weeks or something. And, and she's so gar garrulous that she couldn't sort of not talk. And she, she spoke to her mother and it ruined, you know, the, the operation, but gave her that huskier edge. Give her the rasp. <laughs> gave the Jim Steinman, you know, big epic voice for those. Very good. Yeah. It was her fortune. <laughs> you can imagine being told, if you're told you can't speak for six weeks. Yeah. That would be a lot of pressure, wouldn't it? I think for Bonnie Tyler, particularly. Yeah, particularly. Quite chatty. Yeah. You know, but, uh, yeah, I th that was it. We haven't talked about David Bowie. Go on, come you're on. Like, I've got my original... That was the that was the key moment for me as a, a teenager. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right, original right. Um, Ziggy, and uh, you know I studied that cover, you know, in incredible detail as you do when you're a teenager. And in my my imaginary band of the future would be called K West. K West. That would be my <laughs> name of the band, and I would change my name to K West and be the lead singer and bass player. Although I can never play the bass, but in in that band. Um, but I think the real moment for me, you know, which flipped me musically was the the opening of the album on, you know, five years when that came on and that drum yeah. intro comes in, that that changed my life. And like many people, my haircut at the same time, you know, it was a, a big, big. How did you look at that yeah. time? Describe yourself. Well, I had the first David Bowie haircut in Cumbran, and uh, right. I, I went down. I think I, I listened to Billy Bragg when he did this with you, uh, and uh, yeah. uh, he did the same thing. I went down to the local hairdresser with a picture of, of David Bowie and said, um, I, you know, I want this. I want to look like this. That's now I want, to know, I want to know what your local, it wouldn't be a hairdresser, would it? It'd be a, bar a barber. Yeah, barbers, but but they, were, they were Italians. So they oh were, well, you know, so they were, nearly. Okay. So there were two. There were two choices in Cumbria. You either went to Fred's up in uh, Pont Newydd, which you, you you could get a short back and sides, or you could get a crew cut. But you had to have a note from your mam if you wanted a crew cut. Really? Uh, <laughs> uh, or you could go to Kim's, who are a bit more sophisticated in the town centre, the Italian sort of uh, barbers. And but literally, it was like I, I held the picture and said, "I want uh, you know, I want I want to look like this," and you know. Did they have? Did You're your not barbers have surgeons, mate? You know, I'm you. <laughs> did your barbers have pictures of people on the wall? I can still remember my earliest memories. There would be a picture of George Best, I think yeah. Steve McQueen, and yeah. I think probably um, uh, the, the Napoleon Solo. Oh, uh, right. Is that David, David McCallum? Robert Vaughan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you could go and say, "I want to look like that." You know? yeah. well, <laughs> they didn't have Bowie up on the wall. They didn't have was, Bowie. It has to be said. Like something out of a movie because the young apprentice in the corner was sweeping up the hair. They all said, "Oh, I don't know how that." He said, "I'll do it." You know. So it was the, the uh, young. I'll have, have a go. I'll have, have a go. go. If it doesn't work out, too bad. And, and you know, for about two minutes, it looked something like it. Then it all flopped down again. You know, and sort of uh, didn't quite know how to you know achieve right. it. So you didn't dye it orange or anything like that. 
Well, uh, yeah, occasionally, but not um, permanently. We used to use food dye to do that, so you could wash it out when you, so your parents, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you have a band as a teenager? Yes, um, but we didn't, um, we didn't play many gigs. I think was first, our first gig was a bit of disaster. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to play the drums in the band to start out with. So my friend Mark Silva had a drum kit for sale uh, for 14 quid secondhand. And I, I didn't have 14 quid. So I got the drum kit bit by bit and put it in the shed at the bottom of the garden and assembled it in the hope that once it was there and I started playing it, that my parents would say, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, fine, we'll give you the 14 pounds for the <laughs> drum kit. But it didn't quite work out that way. And um, uh, and I had to return it. But on, a, on our first gig, I think the drum kit fell apart as I was playing it. It was a bit of a disaster. So <laughs> I stuck then to play folk clubs a bit more with my sister. <laughs> what was the name of the names of the early band? The name of the group. Oh, well, always K so telling. K West. Of course. Oh, it was oh, called was you did follow oh, Google right. K West. Of Ziggy Stardust, yeah, absolutely. Right. And were you K West in the band? Of, well, in my own imagination. In your yes. own imagination. I don't, I, I don't think I quite, you know, sort of established with the rest of the guys in the band that um, it was going to be my band and I, it would be called K West and I would be K West. But um, we didn't quite get to that stage. So you so turned to kind of folk, folk music. Yeah. yeah. What kind of thing did you, what did you learn about the kind of material that goes down well in folk clubs? Well, um, I loved all that West Coast stuff, probably through my sisters mainly. So lots of, you know, kind of, you know, it's Crosby, Stills and Nash, Joni Mitchell, all that. You know, I've got Blue here, which everybody just lords yeah. these days. But it was actually commercially not, not that big an album at the, no, at the so, time. No, it and wasn't. So I used to do um, Neil Young songs and Joni Mitchell songs, as well as some Irish songs and, and uh, attempted my own songs, you know, because I wrote songs from the age of about, 13 um my dad came home one day with a with a piano which appeared in the in the front came room. home with a piano <laughs> it, 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 he used to, to do me, things to like that. He'd go, yeah. it, and i think it was being thrown out of the local club or something like that and he said oh i like that and so there was a piano appeared in the front room and uh my sister's boyfriend taught me how to play guitar chords on it so i i, I started writing songs on piano and guitar you know as a, as a teenager um, but who was the main influence then? I'd say probably you know Neil Young, yeah, Bowie. It was a bit different. Joni Mitchell, uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash. All those. So, we, so when you sang a Neil song. Young, when you sang a Neil Young song in a folk club, yeah, you know whatever it is, I yeah. believe in you or whatever. Yeah. Did you? This thing always fascinates me. How can you sing a Neil Young song without seeking to sound like Neil Young? Well, you his vocal stuck. <laughs> so do you, it's an effectively an impression, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Well, no, you I mean, have that, to transpose it down an octave. I think that's how you learn though, isn't it? At first is by, you know, trying to kind of play. Yeah. And, and don't forget back then you couldn't look it up on YouTube. And, no, you know, absolutely. no, no. Absolutely. You, you have to wait for a whistle test on a Tuesday night. And, yeah. And see, <laughs> what did he put his hand just then? What was that? Absolutely. Was that? Yeah, if, you, was if, you, if you wanted to play a song, if you were in a band, you had to get the record and just pick the needle up, yeah. put it back countless times, trying to work out what the lyric was. You couldn't just yeah, Google and, the whole thing. And you you didn't even know the, 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 the words properly at the time. I've got a oh. single here that, that I found, which which I've always loved this single. It, it's Chicago's version. This is from 69, um, uh, actually. My sister, no doubt, would have would have bought it, but I inherited it. Chicago's version of I'm a Man. Which, oh, right. Big yeah. hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big, yeah, big hit. And on the other side, great song called Does Anybody Know What Time, what it, time it Is? Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant brass thing on it. But if you've ever listened to Chicago's version of I'm a Man, the lyrics bear no resemblance to the original, um, you know, which was um, Steve Winwood's song, wasn't it? I think originally. Was that um, the original? I don't know. I mean, yeah, the, 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 Steve Winwood, I think it was. was it, is, he, is his name on as the writer, Steve Winwood? Yeah, who's it credited yeah, to? Steve Winwood, S. Winwood, J. Miller. Yeah, is, is on yeah. as well. Oh, okay, Jimmy Miller as well. The <laughs> lyrics bear no resemblance to the original lyrics no, no, no. To, the, to the song i think they just heard the record and couldn't quite understand yeah. a brit jackson chicago and just sang anything that uh, that came into their mind so when mark was, and i were working on smash hits he used to occasionally get uh, something would go in the charts huge hit huge new hit and you ring up the publisher you do a deal you have to pay them to reproduce the lyrics and you'd say have you got a copy of the lyrics 
And quite often they say, no, we don't have it at all. Yeah. We, we, we advise you to just listen to the record. <laughs> so effectively, they're selling something that they don't have. Yeah, <laughs> really, it's right. Yeah. They don't but, have the music. Yeah. They don't have the words. But that will be. And if you think how much pounds. we had to pay, we had to pay five hundred quid, didn't we, to use somebody? Well, lyrics. sometimes. Yeah, which yeah. you then have to transcribe yourself. It's like saying I'm yeah. the publisher of a book, but you can write it. Basically, yeah, it's <laughs> it's a very odd, it's very odd thing, mm. extraordinary. So yes, um, after yeah, the folk they, clubs, then what, what what was what was the next step? Music. So I went off. I went off to university. And I think at that time there wasn't a concept that. Although I, I, maybe I'm wrong about this because thinking about the ugly rumors, but in my mind there was never a concept that you could have a band in university. You either went out on the road when you were left school, went out on the road with your band, or you went to university. So when I went to um, to university, I sort of stuck to you know playing the uh, the acoustic guitar and you know singing and occasionally in clubs and just at parties and things like that and 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 really didn't wasn't in a band when I was in university and it was only later when uh, when I went into teaching that I I started playing live again in a band but we I played in a band called Cadlan and we did a lot of folky dance things you know and stuff you know kind of Kayleys and Tumpaths and all that sort of stuff so we had very much a lineup of you know fiddle and mandolin and what's guitar. your opening song at a Kaylee at a Kaylee then how, how do you how do you fill the floor well yes. they 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 you have a caller is how you fill the floor oh right okay. uh, yeah, you, do. Yeah. you actually have somebody who, uh, who whose job it is to get people up and once you get them going you can't you know you can't stop them and uh, there's a whole sort of repertoire. I've got a file somewhere of all the old, you know, repertoire of stuff we used to do of Irish and, and Welsh tunes, mainly Irish tunes, because there's so many of them. And uh, uh, that, that, you know, are guaranteed floor fillers every time, whether it's a reel or a jig or whatever it is. It's really true that the caller, it's amazing, amazing the caller idea hasn't spread to other forms of music, isn't it really? Because it works. Perhaps. Somebody in charge should say, you there, you there. <laughs> Do people, this. But yeah, people need to be told that the people want they to get on dance to... floors, but they just don't quite have the nerve. And yeah. They think it looks like they're showing off if they do. But if it's <laughs> no, with, with a caller, it's like line yeah, dancing like... and all that yeah, stuff, you know. It is Lindy, Lindy like... Hop. I went to a party once, there's a Lindy Hop thing, and it was we all kind of scoffed oh at first. And it was absolutely amazing. You all line yeah. up and everybody has to dance with everybody in a row, 20 people. And, and it, but then you've met everybody who's at the party, you know, yeah, if I, briefly. It's a great I idea. suppose in, 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 in old, you know, back in the day when these things started, it was the only way once a year at the market fair or something that you ever got to encounter a member of the opposite sex in a legitimate sort of... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's quite an important kind of, um, you know, social thing to do. But actually it worked very well at um, all sorts of events at, you know, weddings and things like that. You know, people have a disco and it's all pretty drab and sad sometimes yeah, but you know, one of these live bands and you you do this it's, it's intergenerational and lots of fun and everybody always ends up enjoying it no have you ever been in a covers band just playing kind of rock covers well mp4 really i suppose oh, MP4, um, of course, yeah. although we do we do do a few of of uh of my songs sometimes but um slip them in there when people don't notice but we do lots of covers and anything from the beatles to the have you ever done a wedding uh yes um, God, we're, Dave and I are fascinated by songs that work at weddings. It's got to be yeah, multi generational, yeah, isn't it? So, yeah. what, what are the ones that you play at weddings that, that, that will guarantee to fill the floor? I suppose uh, something like um, I Saw Her Standing There is an absolute. Oh, right. oh okay. That's cool. Every time. I, I think that never yeah. fails. You know, it, for some reason, there's something about it, even though it was never a single, was it? I don't think I saw her standing there. It wasn't. No, a, a hit, no it wasn't. But it absolutely, every time, if you want to get people dancing, that works. Yeah. So uh, you've been at the party conference. Are there any musical events on the fringes of the party conference? Are there, um, are there discos and kind of bands playing or anything like that? Yeah, there, there usually are. I mean, this year, uh, there, there, I know there was some karaoke going on, you know, behind the scenes a bit. And at the Daily Mirror party, they always have a bandioke where they have a band, you know, playing and, and, and people get up and, and, uh, and join in and sing. Have you participated in that? I, I have been oh, so what's your karaoke tune well i used to for a laugh do toxic by britney spears just <laughs> to, just just for the entertainment value of it 
Um, but you know, if I was just gonna, you know, do something, you know, I can, you know, your Mustang Sally never fails, that kind of thing. Or yeah, even yeah. The Angels, if you want everybody, Robbie Williams, if you want everybody to 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 join in on the chorus, that's uh, that 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 usually you know goes down well. Um, it, it, for a joining in thing, the, the MP4 we did used to play at party conferences as a band quite regularly. We, we so we played at Labour conference several times, but also because. We're cross party. We played at Tory party conference, right? Um, and the SMP conference actually on a couple of occasions down oh, the wow. years. So um, yeah, we, we do, so there, there's quite often a bit of music going on in the at the periphery of the concert of the conference. How uh, I've never been to a party conference, but I've obviously been to lots of kind of company conferences or work conferences, and I'm fascinated to know how much it resembles those. I mean, do you end up at the after two days thinking I've eaten too much? I've drunk too much. What did I say to somebody in the bar last night? Have I gone too far here? Yeah. Have I ruined my reputation by <laughs> doing something idiotic? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, they are, you know, they're very bibulous events and, you know, they go on way into the night and people have too much to drink in hotel bars and, you know, uh, are likely to say the wrong thing. In fact, uh, as uh, my old mate Tom Watson was reminding me recently, Back in 2008, I think it was, or 2009, he was followed round. And because, you know, I was with him, I, I also followed round by, you know, some of Rupert Murdoch's, you know, private investigators who were filming oh, really? what he was doing as he went around conference to try and, you know, discredit him. All this is, you know, revealed in, in documents to the court. Was he aware everything. that he was being filmed? Not at the time, no. And but How was, were they oh, filming him? <clears throat> Well, they they commissioned a videographer, believe it or not. All right. <laughs> the uh, I think the, um, the, the 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 kind of private investigators that Murdoch's lot had to to get some to go around and discreetly film whatever he was doing in a in a hope they could get a, a story out of it, you know. And uh, I don't think I don't think they ever did, but. God, but so it's, it's bad all, enough being it's all revealed in these hacking cases, you know. It, what was, what was happening? It's bad enough being at a conference thinking you're going to make a complete fool of yourself in front of your own colleagues, but the idea that the press are also trying to to yeah. publicly humiliate you must make it my, agonizing. Christ. My 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 greatest es- my greatest escape at conference uh, was uh, that one year um, I was playing the piano at about three o'clock in the morning with I think Billy Bragg was there actually singing along as well at the time and uh it, it was three o'clock in the morning i think we got thrown out for disturbing the prime minister who was trying to prepare his speech for <laughs> the, the, tony blair for the for the next for the next day and in the, the, the there was a report of it in the press and and i had a colleague whose name was kevin Barron, not kevin brennan and in the diary item in the newspaper it said and you know the prime minister was awoken by raucous singing accompanied by billy bragg uh with Kevin Barron MP playing the piano. So I completely dodged the bullet on uh, oh. the <laughs> waking him up. Oh, well, well, no, it's so extraordinary. It's been so nostalgic so, seeing the, the Blair Brown TV series. Did you see yeah. that the other night? Oh. Yeah, I've watched the first two because they're, they're available. Yeah. On player, and it is, um, well, it's amazing seeing the, everybody looking so much younger, isn't it? Because everybody gradually starts resembling their spit in image puppet as they get older. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. And uh, they, they look yes, so... some great incredible. haircuts. Seeing Gordon and uh, Brown and Tony Blair looking so incredibly young, it is, it is uh, you know, an incredible thing to see. What was he like as a lead singer? <laughs> as a lead singer? Well, he was good, actually. He's a fantastic showman. I mean, I can't remember how strong his voice was, really. I mean, we only played five or six times, but he was just incredibly good with crowds, just just amazingly good. It, it, I can it, remember it, playing a gig and um, the drums, for some reason, came unstuck from the stage. You have to nail these blocks in yeah. to keep the drums there. And this came out, and the drums started falling apart. One of them, I can remember one of the, the Tom Thomas was just rolling off the edge of the stage. So we couldn't play. We just ground to a halt in the middle of, uh, of Honky Tonk Women or whatever it was. I remember him just holding the crowd and just talking for five, five or ten minutes while we hastily pinned all this back together again. Just being really entertaining, talking about gigs he'd seen and what was coming out later and what we were doing and records he liked. And He was just yeah. fantastically charismatic. It was a, so a sign of, of what was to come. Is it Absolutely. true that you went in and jammed with him at number 10 when he was Prime Minister, Mark? D- did I? No, I didn't, no. Oh, you did- didn't? All right, I heard a rumour you had. Okay. No, I had no. <laughs> God, I wonder if anybody did. 
you think he and Noel Gallagher got the guitars out? It's possible. Almost certainly. I yeah, thought. yeah. Almost certainly, yeah. But I suppose that's a lead singer syndrome, isn't it? It's in, they get insufficient credit because when you're a, when you're a starter group and all groups begin as kind of complete amateurs, the, the, the people with instruments can kind of look as if they're operating machinery, can't they? As if they're doing important work. Whereas the mm. singer is the person who has to stand there and go, no, it's just me. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? yeah. And, 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 they, and this is the thing I always find absolutely fascinating about Mick Jagger. There was a 19-year-old LSE student who suddenly decided he was going to behave like that. He's mm. going to stand up on stage in front of these guys and be utterly over the top. And he's done it ever since. No, it and is. That's it nerve. is I love and there's, some, there's something different also about being a lead singer when you're not playing an instrument. Because you're yeah. playing that's an instrument, what I mean. You, yeah, that's, that's right, what yeah, I mean. Completely exposed, aren't you? You know, there's, yeah, there's yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah, and he doesn't even have a kind of idea. tambourine or anything like that. He's just that's because that's all you there is that there is that physical thing that uh, and I don't know. I don't know if you've got any comment on this, Kevin, because, you know, I used to find if when I was on telly many years ago, it was a lot easier if you were behind a desk because you, you it, it, it's that physical Security. exposure. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, the dispatch box or whatever, that must yeah. help to just have that in front of you. Whereas if you're standing on your own, you're thinking, oh, God, is everybody looking at me? <laughs> Do you feel well, that? I, I think I think that is undoubtedly true, and and um, you know, there's the, I mean, lead singers, the best ones often have a, a certain bill as well, don't they? That sort of skinny, sort of snake hip, sleek yeah, yeah. kind of yeah. look, which which helps immensely. And in, in Mick Jagger's case, I always love that footage of him performing after they've had James Brown on that American yeah, yeah. TV special, and yeah, you can see him show. upping upping the lead singer antics even more after witnessing the great. James Brown, you know, and how to do do the whole thing. But, um, you know, being the lead singer, you've got nothing except, I suppose, the microphone stand is a good prop sometimes for the lead singer, which they'd uh, use as a, a for a bit of air guitar. A lot, a lot of guitar players, I think, particularly in, in rock bands, start off in their bedroom with a guitar, trying to, what they'd now say, shred, you know, and, and play all sorts yes. of yeah. you know, complicated licks when, when really all you want is a bit of solid playing at, you know to, to keep the, the the thing together in a band but they end up what i call you know bedroom guitarists and you get some people and you get them in a band setting and 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 they've just got no idea to play with anyone else because they're so used to just you know playing mm. guitar on their own in, in in a bedroom but uh, there is something in the mentality of a lead singer i think you've got to be a bit messianic really to be a good lead singer and perhaps I like think Jagger is, a, <laughs> Jagger is remarkable if you look at the footage of him from very early on in his career on telly particularly he had the nerve to look at the camera mm. look straight to a camera he kind of stares the camera game. out doesn't he absolutely amazing not mm. embarrassed at all no and this is this lad from you know suburban Surrey or wherever he came Kent um, you know nothing in his background could have prepared him for that at all he just decided no. to do it what, yeah, um, you know, you would have thought there might have been a bit of English reserve and embankment, you know. And there, there uh, didn't appear to be at all. Not at no. all, yeah. Uh, anyway, what else you got there? Have you got a greatest record ever made? Ah, right, well, I don't know. This, I suppose this might be it. It's an obvious choice, and this belonged to my sister, but I inherited it as well, which is obviously... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. And, uh, it, it, it's there, and it's an original. It's very sort of... I was going to say, that's that a really old one, is it? Yeah. Is that a mono copy? Genuine old is one. Yeah. Is it mono? Mono, mono, mono. And, uh, it's got to be worth know, a couple of bob, isn't it? I no. doubt it. Not in that condition, no. I wouldn't have thought. It still plays, but, um, you know, and it's, you know, but I, I doubt it's uh, it's worth much in, in that sort of condition. That You know, obviously that's a... That's a I, I still love, though, as a single, although it wasn't a single originally, Life on Mars, um, Bowie, I still think that is an incredibly epic record. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the fact that it was um, a sort of obscure track on on Hunky Dory and then got revived as a single. And I don't think Bowie ever had a number one at that time, did he? It might, might only have got to number two. Bowie, or... David Bowie didn't have a number one, <laughs> I think I'm right in saying, until Ashes to Ashes, or right? What, Could what, be, yeah. Uh, possibly. Starman? Starman no, was no, 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 no,
Number four. Uh, I'm probably got yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Um, was the Let's Dance number one? Let's Dance was number one. Yeah. Let's Dance, no was his Let's Dance was his last proper hit, wasn't it? I guess I think so. it was. Yeah, what about <laughs> was China Girl a hit? Yeah, China Girl was the follow-up. Um, yeah. Um, I think it was like some more one. I don't know. I don't but, know. But, um, but anyway. But Life on Mars. I just think, oh, you must tell was. us about the record, your record too, actually. Well, yeah, I should do. Uh, which you've heard of the clown and the cigarette girl, which has yeah. Glenn Matlock. There it, it is. There it is, yeah. yeah. There it is, yeah. Glenn so, Matlock playing bass. How did that happen? Well, Glenn, I met Glenn a few years ago um, doing some campaigning because I do quite a lot of political. And we were doing some campaigning on there. Yeah, the, the fact that the airlines wouldn't let musicians take their take their instruments on the planes with them, and I, me and him went to meet the transport minister and all sorts to try and get the government to compel the airlines to stop turning musicians away or forcing them to put their friendly. And uh, <clears throat> just through that, when 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 I was doing this, uh, I, I didn't ask him. He just offered. He said, do you want me to play bass on it? So I said, yeah, you know, and it's great because um, he brings such a edge. You know, I'm quite a folky and he brings that uh, rocky edge to the, to the playing on it. it. gives it a lot of propulsion. I think some of the. Yeah, it's a lovely record. It's, it's kind of like an old school 70s singer songwriter record. It's got all these kind of folk echoes yeah. and lovely references to kind of Welsh Folklore, you know, there's the mention of the of the of the, of the shipwreckers of Glamorgan yeah. in the 17th century, as the night streets of Newport, yeah. people sailing from Pembrokeshire yeah. to New York, the immigrants. You know, it's just lovely. I love yeah, I think I think um, well, it's it's you, you know, you get to a certain stage in life, and writing "She Loves You," yeah, 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 is probably no longer available. No, but I've always loved narrative. I've always loved narrative songs. I always loved the idea of of telling and trying to tell a complete story you know, in a three minute song and the fact that you can do that. And that same story could be a novel. It could also be a film, but you can do it in a three minute song and it still tells the story. So I tend to say to, to people who, you know, friends of mine, if I play them a song, did you understand the story? You know, did you understand what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when it's a story song. And uh, so there's a song about Johnny Owen, the Welsh boxer as well on there, who was tragically killed in the ring in the early eighties. And, you know, those, those, which, those sorts of songs quite fascinate me. I think, I remember many years ago, David, you, you won't remember this. I think we were sat next to each other at some music awards thing and we were talking about Colin Malloy of the Decemberists. And, uh, oh, my goodness. Well, it can't be that long ago. Really, were we? Oh, yeah, God, and, we? And, and, oh and, was that? And, yes. With a BPI were, you, table. As I'm like, yes. You were complimenting him on his diction when he sang. Absolutely. Yes. And, uh, uh, yes. And and I was thinking, and actually, it had an impact on me. I thought that's, that's very true. Actually, is that it, a lot of songs? It doesn't really matter whether you can understand the lyrics or not. But in in that kind of music, and he obviously is a master of narrative songwriting. In that kind of music, it's really important that that you you know understand what's being sung. And uh, uh, so. I, I took that lesson from you. Oh, well, for, <laughs> thank you from Colin Malloy rather than me. But yes, I haven't thought about that for years. Colin Malloy is a fantastic. Dude. What a really a brilliant, really song complicated writer. songs. Yeah. And but you, I, as my mother used to say when she used to come to school plays, <laughs> what do you think, mother? She used to say, "I could hear every word you said," <laughs> which is. It's the most wonderful way of getting out of that's a brilliant that's the equivalent of you done it again. Yeah. <laughs> you done it again. Yeah. Only yeah. you can put on a show like that. You <laughs> couldn't have been better. You couldn't or, have been better. Could have been better. You could have been better. That's right. Oh, oh what a night is another great one. What do you think? What a night. <laughs> yeah, my mother oh. says when she sees me in Parliament, you look nice. <laughs> oh, right. You see, that's what she's thinking of. Yeah. When you, where can, when where you, can people get that record then? So how, it's, um, how can everyone get hold of it? It's actually on on Revolver Records, um, who are, are a nice little label, and um, it'll be the, there's a single out on Spotify uh, called Tabernacle Lane. Um, the record will be out on Revolver Records, and hopefully we'll be able to to get a link to how they can uh, uh, pick that up and get that up. Oh, good! I will put that in for you when you when you send it. Yeah. Yeah, but, so this uh, is going to be the first first time ever we can close the conversation with a member of parliament by saying, good luck with the album. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm, this has I'm never ho- happened before. I'm, I'm hoping to sell dozens. So yeah, good luck with that difficult <laughs> second album. <laughs> yeah, you got to sell something in the high <laughs> dozens. I'm worried about the, I'm worried about the difficult second album. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, is is there a House of Parliament shop where stuff like this is sold? Does that go on? Yeah, yeah there must be a merch rack where you get uh, erasers and pencils and things. Couldn't they have a, a you know a, a there, Labour MP solo album? I would have thought there is a house. Be. There is a House of Common shop, but for some reason they always refused to stock the MP4 records when we, when we made some some albums. Oh, really? It's very very disloyal of them to. That is disloyal. Uh, refuse to do so. They sell yeah. all. This, all this tat with, uh, you know, House of Commons logos on it. And when you've got, you know, people who are legends in their own imaginations trying to sell their <laughs> records. Yes. They turned us down for some oh, commercial dear. reason or other. I don't know. but it's Well, outrageous. maybe you should revisit that. You should revisit that, definitely. Well, definitely. <laughs> so <laughs> nice to talk been, to you. It's been really nice to talk to you. Uh... Word in your attic. A Zoom with a View.